Now, every visitor to Rome knows that the Pope in Latin is the Pontifex Maximus. One only has to confront a Trevi Phantom uh, to be confronted by a, a superfluity of Pontifex Maximi uh, presenting themselves as in triumphal form um, all over uh, this 18th century Phantom. The Phantom replaced a 15th century Phantom. This is the earliest depiction of it. And historians usually point to this first Trevi Phantom of 1453 during the pontificate of Nicholas V as the beginning, as the point at which the um, popes first started calling themselves the Pontifex Maximus. <clears throat> but how and why did the popes come to adopt what had originally been a pagan and imperial title? The Trevi Fountain is fed by the Aqua Virgo, a Roman aqueduct. It's a nearby, um, the nearby uh, just around the corner indeed from the fountain, uh, the aqueduct is still visible with an inscription commemorating its restoration by Claudius in 46 AD. <clears throat> And in this contemporary pair of contemporary illustrations, you can see on the left that the aqueduct is made to look like a fountain, as if one had inspired the construction of the other. Indeed, the basin that you can see in the depiction on the left uh, was created at a later date to compound or, or tighten the parallel, parallelism between the two. But in fact, what you see on the left is merely a set of arches supporting an aqueduct whereas what you see on the right is, in fact, a phantom. So what we can see in putting these two contemporary mid-17th century images together, an argument for the origins of the papal title Pontifex Maximus in the direct imitation of classical epigraphy in this inscription on the top commemorating Claudius's restoration of the aqueduct Claudius is called, amongst other titles, Pontifex Maximus. But Milton, in Paradise Lost, reminds us that Pontifex Maximus admits of more than one interpretation. For Milton, um, the pontifical represented the ability of the papacy to bridge hell and bring it onto earth. For, for him, the Pontifex was a symbol of sin and death brought about by the papacy. So this controverted quality of the title Pontifex Maximus gives our question its edge. How and why adopt a pagan and imperial title for the papacy? Thomas Hobbes, also writing in the 17th century, speculated that Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, had transferred imperial religious authority to the Pope. After converting to Christianity, he had handed over the authority represented by the title to the Pope. And the successors to this pope, Sylvester, then justified their supremacy as bishops of the city of Rome, in particular, the imperial capital, by employing this repurposed title for themselves. But modern historians have generally looked to the Renaissance revival of classical epigraphy, or generally, um, as the motivator for the popes adopting this title for themselves. And represented here in the person of Ciriaco d'Ancona, um, and yet this merely raises a new question. Why in the 15th century did the Pope begin to see himself in the title of Pontifex Maximus? If he had not done so before, why at this moment did he see himself as the Pontifex Maximus? And indeed it leads to a subsidiary question, which came first? The development of an imperial papacy, a papacy which had an imperial identity, or the papal adoption of an imperial title. Now, Pontifex Maximus is current as a title for the Pope by the High Renaissance. And indeed, Erasmus, and indeed, Erasmus used it um, when writing to Pope Leo X, for example, used it in his letters. But it doesn't occur to him ever in his usage of it, that it was a historically derived title, as we can see here in this passage from his later dialogue, the Ciceronianus. In this passage, 
he, uh, Erasmus is emphasizing the gap that exists between his world and that of Roman antiquity as part of an argument as to why uh, an arch Ciceronian vocabulary, a vocabulary derived entirely from Cicero, cannot really be applied. He makes the point that things such as the, pontif the pontificate maximi no longer exist. He equates the pontifex maximus, neither with the pope in his capacity as the head cult of the chief Roman deity, the Flamidialis, or in his capacity as the overseer and the head of the Roman capital, the sumus civitatis praefectus. So Erasmus highlights here a weakness in a historical epigraphic explanation. That is to say, a weakness in an explanation that has the Pope seeing himself uh, as the Pontifex Maximus in ancient inscriptions. Nowadays, though, the usage doesn't even present itself, or it doesn't even register as problematic. Uh, Papa, one of the other Latin terms of for the Pope is also, of course, the Italian word for the Pope, and basically now has an Italian connotation. Papa Francesco, Papa Benedetto, for example. So Pontifex Maximus is the Latin term most casually accepted as simply meaning Pope. And yet, it is to this day not part of the official titulature, despite its usage on monuments. It's not part of the official papal title. So, what questions are we asking here? We've set, out the, we've set out the historical question, but there's some other questions that I want us to have in mind as we're going forward. One of them is about looking and seeing. These inscriptions of Pontifex Maximus are around in Rome from antiquity. So how do people start seeing the Pope in a term commonly used in these ancient inscriptions? People previously saw the inscriptions but didn't necessarily see themselves in them. And as we shall see, even in the 15th century, popes are only seen in the inscriptions after the title has been developed by humanists for literary reasons, and then adopted, but for reasons entirely removed from that epigraphic presence. So historical epigraphic explanations, we'll see, are post facto. Another question I want us to have in mind is the relationship between style and ideas. So we tend to think normally that style is posterior to ideas. That is, we have a thought, we have an idea, and then we think of the correct style in which we want to present it. But in the Renaissance, and indeed in other ages where rhetoric ruled, that need not be the case. So our story is also a case study in the social and cultural implications of literary values, so the implications of the revived classical Latin of the Renaissance humanists. And in probing here further the relationship between literature and epigraphy, and literature and history, we'll also get at the historicity of the papacy itself, how the papacy began to be conceived as a historical institution. Go back to the beginning. The Romans credited the term Pontifex Maximus, created the office of the uh, Pontifex Maximus, to the creation of Numa Pompilius, the, um, well, at least partly legendary, uh, second king of the, of the Romans in the regal period, and often uh, presented as a lawgiver, as a creator of institutions. As you can see here, Varro, in his uh, Dictionary of the Latin Language, presents, approaches the title um, through etymology, whereas Livy and his Antiquarian History of Rome much more focuses on the role of individuals in the creation of this office. In practice, the Pontifex Maximus was an elected office. He was the chief of the College of Pontiffs, charged with oversight of religious matters. Sort of, if you like, the chief operating officer of Roman religion. It wasn't technically the supreme priesthood 
nor indeed the priesthood of the supreme deity. Jupiter had his own personal dedicated priest, uh, the Flamen Dialis, who would qualify for that role. But it was a position of high status in Republican society, and it was, for example, key to the rise of Julius Caesar, who famously um, borrowed a colossal amount of money to purchase the office for himself, and having done so, uh, advertised it on a series of coins issued in his name with the equipment of uh, Roman religion displayed quite prominently on it. And you can see on the coin on the left, Caesar is represented wearing the headdress of the Pontifex Maximus. <clears throat> the term became part of the package of titles and offices which the first emperor, the founder of the Principate Augustus, took up unto himself, along with various other offices, the tribune of the people, and so on and so forth. You can see here in his Res Gestae, his autobiography, um, uh, his uh, discussion of <coughs> his accepting, taking on this title. He did this in part to present himself as the heir to Julius Caesar. It was part of legitimizing his position as the successor to Caesar. But Augustus took this particular role less for power as such than because of one of its functions had to do with morality, social morality. And he used his role as Pontifex Maximus uh, as the, um, the foundation for his series of sort of attempted moral reforms of Roman society. Famous thing that the Alabacana Augustus statue uh, presents him wearing the full robes of the Pontifex Maximus. And thereafter, the term becomes a fundamental part of imperial titulature down to the late empire. One of millions of examples of Porta Majoi, um, in which the Emperor Claudius is um, given this title amongst many, many other titles victor, triumph, or defeater of this or that group. <clears throat> Now, historians have long accepted that the Christian emperors maintained the title, even as they interfered quite actively uh, in the Christian religion. Um, early modern historians often argue that the moment Constantine converted to Christianity, he, see, he and his successors ceased to call themselves Pontifex Maximus. But in fact, it's quite clear that the fourth century Christian emperors continued to call themselves the administrative head of the pagan Roman religion. However, um, by the late 4th century, it seems that this situation was no longer tenable. And the uh, historian Zosimus, writing in the 6th century, but looking back, um, informs us or tells us that Gratian was the last to use it. It's part of a somewhat labored joke that Zosimus isn't a great joke teller, but in, he makes an attempt in this case to indicate that because uh, Gratian has declined to accept the robes of the Pontifex Maximus, there will be a new Pontifex Maximus, who is the Emperor Maximus, who's about to kill him. Um, so that, that's the, the explanation for that particular uh, witticism. But, um, so you're looking at, in addition, the last known epigraphic uh, use of the title, which is an inscription commemorating the rebuilding or the restoration of the Ponticestio in Rome in 370 by the three emperors, I was the first, Valens and Gratian, all of whom call themselves Pontifex Maximus, amongst, amongst many other titles. It's important to note this context of this last epigraphic usage, because this is also the last bridge built in Rome until the Renaissance. There are no bridges built after this for another thousand years. Alan Cameron's pointed out recently that a, a sort of replacement title started being used, Pontifex Incletus, sort of distinguished pontiff, something like that, was used occasionally by Christian emperors in, in the sixth century. That's about a bit of it. Now, what did not happen is, or was, a straightforward handoff at this point of the title from the emperor to the Pope, as is, of course, suggested by the famous forged document, the Donation of Constantine, in which um, the Constantine, after having been cured of leprosy by the Pope Sylvester, uh, hands over sort of supreme authority um, to the papacy. So this is not what happens. Early Christian titulature um, is a complicated <coughs> and messy problem. Uh, especially in the Latin language, because many of the titles are translations from Greek terminology. 
The hierarchy of the early church was in flux. Practice varied from place to place. Um, scholars who've worked on this problem have indicated that the term pontifex, just meaning, well, from where we get our word pontiff, um, was very early in use for bishop and indeed for Christ. And it, was, uh, it, it came into the Latin language in second century translations of um, early Christian texts from Greek into Latin. But in fact, the earliest Christian usage of the term Pontifex Maximus is actually as a term of abuse for the Pope. You can see here, Tertullian is a great author of sort of angry denunciations, and uh, this is one of many, and he is claiming, at any rate, that someone he calls the Episcopus Episcoporum, probably, therefore, the Pope, or like just the first, um, by chronology, has allegedly issued an edict saying it's basically fine to commit adultery or fornicate as long as you say sorry afterward. Um, I mean, this seems unlikely, but in any case, uh, as you can see, he says the pont not just the pontifex, but wait for it. He's calling himself a pontifex maximus, so it's clearly a term of abuse. The closest that we have in this early period to an exclusively papal title is summus pontifex, supreme pontifex highest pontiff. It emerges in the 5th century under the Pope Leo I, and it's part and parcel of the doctrine of Petrine supremacy, the idea that the pontiff in Rome, because of Peter, um, is the supreme pontiff in Christendom. The basic point here is that Pontifex Maximus is not used in the Middle Ages as a title for the Pope. But there is medieval usage of Pontifex Maximus as a label for others, and it falls into three streams, which we're just going to have a quick look at. The first stream we might call the historical stream. It's used in discussion of the Roman past. It has an essentially neutral connotation, it, but it can be positive. Here in the text on the left, um, Augustus is recalling a Pontifex Maximus who was a virtuous figure. It's part of his much larger project of carving out a secular space for Roman officialdom to find a way for um, Roman officialdom to be neutral, neither good nor bad. It's quite separate, the secular world as separate from the world determined by um, God's plan. From the ninth century, visitors to Rome record pagan monuments. The manuscript on the right is the famous um, Einsiedeln, um, uh, what it, it's a, the, the pilgrim from Einsiedeln who uh, arrives in Rome and, and records many of the inscriptions, pagan inscriptions, which he sees. But he made, but these, um, this, this record of people observing these inscriptions does not feature any particular comment on them. Um, you can see here, this is the beginning of the inscription we looked at a moment ago on the Pontecesti, the last inscription featuring the term. These visitors didn't evidently recognize anything papal in what they saw, or if they did, they didn't say so. Now, a second stream of usage is what we might call historical or exegetical. Um, it, it originates in the translation of the term high priest from Hebrew or Greek into Latin. You can see here, and um, this is taken from uh, Bede. It's used occasionally for Christ, but typically for Old and New Testament figures in the Latin chronicle tradition. So any, any Latin chronicle text will, will, when it treats Old Testament history, pre-Christian um, pre history, will use the term, as you can see here, Pontifex Maximus of the Jews. Third, the third category is sort of certain special contextual uses, um, denoting an office, perhaps, or perhaps instead for rhetorical emphasis. Uh, in this example here, uh, the historian Wittekind of Corvey, writing about the Saxons in the 10th century, describes the coronation of Otto I in Germany as king. This takes place in 936. He's, he doesn't go to Rome until 962. You can see here, Wittekind calls the Archbishop of Mainz, who crowns Otto I, calls him Pontifex Maximus. And if you glance through this text, you can see it's full of classicizing references. 
even the fact that um, Aachen is said to be near a town that's founded by Julius Caesar and their magistrates and so on and so forth. This is a whole classicizing agenda, literary agenda, to sort of underpin the imperial aspirations of the Saxons. Other uses of this sort might be a bit more pointed, sort of Ma Pontifex Maximus as the best bishop rather than specifically the pope. In other words, making an argument that our bishop is sort of just as important as the pope. A good example of this is Agnellus of Ravenna, who calls the bishop of Ravenna the Pontifex Maximus. And probably what he's doing is saying to Rome, I see your son as Pontifex, and I raise you a Pontifex Maximus. <laughs> um, so equally, um, the Pontifex Maximus can simply denote a special or otherwise distinguished pope. So, um, when, when Calixtus II from Vienne becomes um, a bishop, uh, the Pontifex Pope, uh, local uh, history writers call him Pontifex Maximus, for example, our man in Rome. One potential exception to this is a small collection of texts that come out of Monte Cassino. All of them are connected to the circle of Petrus Diaconus, otherwise known as Petrus Bibliotecarius, who's the resident librarian and antiquary in the mid-12th century. And as you can see from these two examples, Pontifex Maximus is used, used of, his, of historical popes. And especially in the second example, you can see classicism, the sort of classicizing literary agenda, seems to be indicated. But these are real outliers. They pop up in the circle of this individual, and they sort of go nowhere. They disappear after his demise. Another way to approach this um, is to note instead key points where the term isn't used for the Pope. And there are many instances where we might expect it to be where we don't find it. The whole rhetoric of Petrine supremacy, the donation of Constantine, the in-house set of uh, biographies of the Pope, the Liber Pontificalis, papal bulls, papal communications of all sorts. It is never used in these contexts. Nor indeed the literature of the investiture con uh, contest, papal imperial tensions, the Guelphs versus the Ghiblings. None of these instances where the papacy is attempting to assert itself in the secular sphere as having more than just spiritual power, in none of these instances does the term appear. So the obvious question is, why not? The basic problem is one of worldliness. The Pontifex Maximus is, as we've said, a pagan and imperial title, that it's connected to worldly rather than spiritual dominion. And the basic articulation of this problematic is to be found in the writing of Pope Galasius I and Pope from 492 to 6 on what came, comes to be known as the Two Swords Doctrine of the separation, the equal separation of powers. As you can see here, um, in reviewing Old Testament history before Christ, some men were both priests and kings, famously Melchizedek being an example of this. And then the devil um, copied this amongst his own people, that is to say the pagan Romans in this context, such that the emperors called themselves Maximi Pontificates Pontifex, called, each one called themselves Pontifex Maximus. And therefore, they were claiming to be priests and kings at the same time. But now that Christ has come, the emperor isn't a Pontifex anymore, nor does the Pontifex claim to be an emperor. It's the Two Swords Doctrine. So you can see here the same ideological objection which we may imagine motivated Gratian, the Emperor Gratian's refusal of the title, separation of powers. Now, the Two Swords doctrine endures to the age of Petrarch in the 14th century, and the term Pontifex Maximus gets used in it. We can see here a rather unusual text, 14th century antiquarian and sort of courtier at large, Giovanni Cavallini, the first reader of Livy, one of the first readers of Livy after antiquity, and he treats, he discusses Roman history in the context of this reading, and here he deploys the, the term Pontifex Maximus in, the, in his discussion of why the Pope should be based in Rome rather than in Avignon or elsewhere. And you can see what he does is through the rather odd analogy of two charnel houses and their location in one district of Monte. Um, he has one of these represent the authority of um, Caesar, what, what he calls the first monarch of the Romans, the emperor in other words, and the other of these houses 
represent the authority of the Pontifex Maximus. So as you can see in the second paragraph, he goes on to say that the, the, these two houses in Rome, one of them looks to the authority of Imperium, the other looks to the, the authority of Pontificium, if you like. So it's a rather labored analogy. Um, one doesn't normally think of charnel houses as sources of food and sustenance for winged birds. Uh, but nonetheless, this is how they're presented. And therefore, imperial and sacred authority are separate, Caesar versus Metellus, but both belong in Rome. And we can see in his switch of terms that Pontifex Maximus in the first paragraph becomes the historical precedent for Summus Pontifex in the second uh, paragraph. Now, if there is a medieval context for the subsequent papal development of the term, it starts with Isidore of Seville, a great etymologist, dictionary, collect, uh, um, assembler um, of the 6th and 7th century. In his etymologies, the great medieval encyclopedia, he offers a decidedly ambiguous usage of Pontifex Maximus in his general discussion of ecclesiastical hierarchy. It's not really clear, if you read especially the first five lines, it's not clear what office he's talking about. Um, <coughs> characteristically, he's straddling Old Testament and classical knowledge. Isidore often sort of follows the method of not quite knowing how everything fits together, but knowing that he has to fit everything together. So as you can see, the Pontifex of the Princex Sacerdotum, the Dia Sequentium, the Summa Sacerdotus, and the Pontifex Maximus, all rolled into one. So, um, the Pope is not really his concern here, but his definition is so wide that it could be the Pope, or he could be saying that any bishop could also equally well be the Pontifex Maximus. So Isidore's ambiguity is such that the meaning of this definition must depend on the assumptions the reader brought to it. And the most important medieval reader of Isidore is Gratian, the great canon lawyer, who quotes him in extenso when treating church hierarchy of his own. But if you look here, again, he's discussing the summi pontificates, clearly the popes. And he passes directly from considering the pope to Isidore's treatment. Consequently, any reader of Isidore in Gratian would conclude that the pontifex is the pontifex maximus, is the pope. Renaissance humanists begin to use the title Pontifex Maximus for the Pope in literary context towards the end of the 14th century. The first usage that we have found, it's tricky to talk of first usage in this context, but its first appearance in the record that we have is in Boccaccio's fragmentary Life of Petrarch. It's not finished, it's not one of his major works, and it occurs simply as a marker of date, just to talk about Petrarch as a way of identifying something happening in the pontificate uh, or under the Pontifex Maximus Benedict XII. Benedict There's no obvious agenda. It then starts to appear again in one of the earliest bodies of, uh, bodies of writing where it seems to have a bit of a tradition in the letters of Leonardo Bruni, the early Florentine humanist, right from after the period when he arrives at the papal curia and begins working as a secretary for, for the popes. Um, he do doesn't seem to have read Boccaccio's Life of Petrarch, or at least doesn't seem to be alluding directly to it. He doesn't use it as a source in some of his works on Petrarch, so it's unclear exactly where he's getting it from. But he's not the only person to be using this title in the period. That said, uh, copyists, even rather deeply into the 15th century, as in this example, still find his usage to be quite strange. Um, pagan imperial title being used for the pope. And uh, we put this up as a good example of, of this. This is a copy of Leonardo Bruni's letter collection from the mid-15th century. Um, Bruni is writing about how he was received um, eagerly and heard eagerly by the Pontifex Maximus. And, but the scribe has uh, interpreted the abbreviations differently and has changed what would be Maximo to Maxime. 
So he's made it an adverbial expression, turned it into a neutral adverbial expression. So he has not instead of being heard by the Pontifex Maximus, he has not being heard by the Pontifex in particular. Because the copyist isn't really comfortable with this usage, doesn't recognize it. What can we say about Bruni's usage? Well, it's unobtrusive, like in that previous context. It doesn't really add any particular meaning to the letter. Um, it's it can be prominent, but it's incidental. Um, these two examples, which are amongst what seem to be amongst his early usages, are one is a response to a letter of recommendation, and the other is in response to an offer uh, by Niccolo Niccoli, the arbiter of humanist taste in Florence, the big snob of the city, uh, who kind of suggests that he might want to take up the job of chancellor in his hometown, and Bruni um, elegantly refuses. Uh, he doesn't use it always in all of his correspondence, and never when writing on behalf of the Pope, and, he's, but, and particularly with a select set of avant-garde Florentine humanist correspondence. That said, the most important source for the proliferation of Pontifex Maximus as a title for the Pope appears to be Bruni's magnum opus, his history of the Florentine people. This is written between 1415 and 1442, when the entire work is published as the city's official history. But the first six books um, are already published in 1428, and the first book was written by 1416. But the date 1428 is important for when, for when this first appears. Bruni's history of the Florentine people is a remarkable and important work. He models himself off of Livy, uh, and he issues, um, a, a, along with his adoption of a classicizing language, uh, he eschews all post-classical words for clerics. There's no episcopus, there is no papa. Bishops and archbishops he refers to with the Latin term prizual, and the pope is only termed pontifex or pontifex maximus. His first usage in that work in this history, um, and thus in the first book, which appears to the, for the public in 1428, is in his narrative of Italy's salvation by Pope Leo I in, in 452, uh, when Pope Leo turns at, uh, Attila the Hun aside and uh, stops him from uh, progressing further uh, towards Rome. It fits the pattern of Bruni's extreme classicizing tendency um, and as we can see from this passage, it comes attached to no pro-papal ideology. In, in fact, it comes in the context of a, of a brutal attack on papal arrogance. Now, I said that this is a Florentine history, but Bruni is very concerned in this work about the extent, nature, and origins of papal power because those things have implications for Florentine independence. Indeed, he was committed to representing papal power as a break from the Roman Empire, not a continuation, thus a break from the Roman Empire to which Florence was certainly subject. But this is not a continuation which makes Florence continually subject. So his solution, as we can see in this passage, uh, also in that first book, is to present the papacy as a historical institution of the Constantinian settlement. So what happens when Constantine converts to Christianity and, 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 established, and, and establishes Christianity as the Roman state religion? So thus, the papacy in Bruni's telling here is dependent on the empire. But I want to draw our attention to that final passage um, because it includes this kind of barbed remark about the canon lawyers of the Curia. After he makes this case, he says, well, I submit these questions to the judgment of those more learned in canon law, more learned in the use pontificium, the law of the pontiffs, um, uh, which probably suggests that Bruni's own source for some of this is, in fact, creation that we saw earlier. And Isidore's usage in Gratian, because Bruni has been spending about 10 years uh, surrounded by canon lawyers at the Roman Curia when he writes this 
Um, but that said, the neutral linking of Pontifex and Pontifex Maximus to the Pope as Grecian did, um, is perfectly amenable to Bruni's classicizing literary agenda. That's what he cares about. Now, immediately after the publication of those first six books, Bruni's usage seems to be picked up by his followers. 1428 onward, major Florentine, major Florentine, other Italian humans begin using the title quite widely in their own work. Francesco Filelfo, Andrew Bacciolini, and so on. Up here is the first usage of the title for the Pope. Um, I think we're fairly sure of this. Um, outside of Italy, and in fact, it's in England, when the papal nuncio, Pietro, uh, Pietro del Monte, writes to the abbot of St. Albans, telling him about the great success that Eugenius IV, Pontifex Maximus, had in uniting the Eastern and the Roman churches, a success that didn't last very long. But that's the usage. Other humanists, right after 1428, start developing more distinctive usages. Lorenzo Valla addresses the Pope as Pontifex Maximus um, in it when he dedicates his treatise on the true good to Eugenius IV. But already five years later, in 1439, he's demonstrating his, uh, his sensitivity to the title's historical significance uh, when he demolishes the donation of Constantine, the forged document uh, which purported to uh, effect the transfer of secular power supremacy over, over, um, over the Roman Empire to the Pope. It's a, it's a philological tour de force, and one of, his, and one of, his, uh, one of the things he uh, latches onto is the historical error in not calling Constantine Pontifex Maximus, um, which uh, the, the forger reveals his late date by not having called Con Constantine this, because uh, Vala knows well that Constantine held the title and hadn't renounced it. The, the forger had failed precisely to establish a historical foundation for papal titulature by having an imperial pontifex maximus transfer the title to a papal sumus pontifex. That would have been an ideal solution for the forger, but the forger knew no history, so he, so he wasn't able to do that. So the, I, I draw our attention to this because it, I think it still shows Bruni's influence here, looking at the Constantinian moment as key for the nature of the papacy as an institution. But differing from Bruni, Valla is using the title in the course of making a historical argument. Our most important literary usage by a Renaissance humanist, however, is that of the polymath architect, writer, uh, uh, writer of treatises, um, athlete, Leon Battista Alberti. Now, Alberti uses Pontifex for bishop, always. That's his use, and that, that represents a break from what, how Bruni uses the term. Bruni used Prysol. Alberti calls all bishops Pontifex. He even writes a treatise on bishops, which he calls Pontifex. Now, he also often uses it for the Pope. He uses it both for bishops and for the Pope. But in his famous treatise on architecture, De Re Edificatoria, as you can see here, I've put two passages from that up. Um, he uses Pontifex Maximus exclusively as a title for the Pope in De Re Edificatoria. It's often an incidental usage, as we can see here. Um, but it's the first systematic usage of the title for the Pope. Now, this development, is, uh, and significantly this development in a treatise on architecture, and in a treatise on architecture that was shown to Pope Nicholas V, is crucial for our story. Because this is the point at which the humanist literary practice that I've been discussing starts to affect the paper. The most notable example of this, and the one with which we began, is the restoration of the Aqua Virgo, the Aqua Virgine, and the building of the Trevi Fountain by Nicholas or under Nicholas V in 1453. Alberti was in Rome at this time, 
and almost certainly involved in the project. And so we can now say that these two images that we looked at earlier are not, in fact, related, which is to say the 15th century inscription was not inspired by the nearby classical exemplar. Rather, it emerged from this literary tradition dating back certainly from the beginning of the 15th century, if not into the 14th, which we've been tracing. And the tradition, the literary tradition, entered high humanist architectural circles through the person and the writing of Alberti and the construction of this, among the, not in particular, this uh, inscription, the setting up of this inscription in 1453. And indeed, the year 1453 sees a papal rollout of the new title at building works across the city. Not least, at Santo Stefano Rotondo, across the vestibule, you can see here, <coughs> linked to Alberti's associate, uh, Bernardo Rossellino. The uh, text here commemorates uh, how the church of the proto-martyr Stephen, which had fallen into disrepair, was entirely restored by Nicholas fifth Pontifex Maximus in 1453. And indeed, this pope stamping his arms and titles across the city is remarked on by the contemporary di diarist uh, Stefano Infasura. Indeed, in his pontificate, there's a general usage of the title as, of, of Pontifex Maximus as the papal title, not just in monumental public contexts like the fountains and churches, but here on the left, <clears throat> in the funerary slab for Innocent VII, uh, Pope in 1404 to 6, so I illegally photographed it in the Vatican Grottos. Uh, you can see um, both uh, Nicholas V calls himself Aunt Max, but also calls his predecessor Aunt Max here. On the right, you can see similarly a funerary slab set up by Nicholas V for Giovanni di Poggio, who is the Bishop of Bologna, which again calls the Pope by this title. However, under Nicholas V's immediate predecessor, Eugenius IV, we see an initial private take-up of the title. And perhaps this is what we should expect. The term was in use in humanist circles um, since the beginning of the 15th century, uh, and it, it finds itself gradually being deployed in new contexts. So here, what we're looking at is the Della Valle family tomb on the Capitol, on the Capitol line. And in the various inscriptions, they're a bit hard to see in this photo, but they're there, trust me. Um, the Pontifex Maximus references start to appear from the 1440s during the pontificate of Eugenius IV. And indeed, we can forge a direct connection between these private actors taking up the term uh, and the circle of Eugenius IV himself. Uh, on the left, you're looking at the tomb, tomb of Antonio Rido, who was Prefectus Urbis, Prefect of the City. Um, it may ultimately take its, this form in the 1470s, but the point is that he had a direct connection to the Pope. You can see on the right, the Fiorete Doris on the Vatican. Uh, that is Antonio Rido leading the representatives of Rome out of the city to greet Eugenius IV and Sigismund of Luxembourg on their arrival. Interestingly, though, on the doors, um, Eugenius IV is just called Papa. Now, as always, we have to allow for survival vagaries of survival and loss. We have one possible <coughs> outlier when, from 1433, um, in which Eugenius IV may have called himself uh, Pontifex Maximus. It's preserved in the Syllogy, the epigraphic collection of Ketra Sabino. Um, it's commemorating, amusingly, it's commemorating the construction of a dorm for the University of uh, Rome and uh, in Rome. Uh, however, there's a sort of general struggle for control over the university between, um, uh, between the papacy and the city and various other actors. So it's actually a bit difficult to pin down the initiative for this inscription. Nonetheless, we might construct for ourselves um, two stages, a two-stage process in the papal adoption of the title. Private initiative, beginning under Eugenius IV, and papal usage, uh, continuing under Nicholas V. What are the implications of this? Well, first, a little bit more history. 
After Nicholas V, the title steadily becomes a more and more prominent part of papal epigraphy um, and papal epigraphic titulature, and it begins to appear farther afield. Particularly interesting case is in the two tombs um, uh, for Pope Nicholas V's mother, uh, one in Sarzana and one in Spoleto, which seem to be early usages of the title outside of Rome. One of the most famous examples is, is this one right here, um, under Pius II, who sets up this loggia in Siena. The loggia is a classic feature of Tuscan aristocratic architecture, and this represents his family's return to prominence on the back of his papacy, and is a major architectural statement. And, and across the front is inscribed Pius II Pontifex Maximus. The title is also seemingly used on his tomb inscription. Uh, the monument has been moved. It's now in Santa Andrea del Valle, and it's a composite monument. But the original parts uh, have that on, have, or the earliest parts have that on the inscription. Now let's move a generation later. By this time, people around the Pope are now looking for an imperial explanation for a title that has, by this point, already been adopted. So for our story, the most, the most symbolically important statement of uh, the most symbolically important statement of this new imperial ideology connected to the title is that by Sixtus IV, uh, Sixtus IV and in 1475, with the opening of the Ponte Sisto. The Ponte Sisto, the first bridge built in Rome since late antiquity, built on ancient foundations, but this is the first new bridge since the Ponte Cestio that we saw before. And this is actually quite an exciting moment for, for us and uh, hopefully for all of you, because here uh, are the Pontesisto inscriptions. These are the original inscriptions, uh, which were previously at the middle of the Pontesisto, were moved in restoration, uh, and since went missing. And we are very pleased to be able to show these photographs because we have discovered them. And they are now resting peacefully in a private area of the gardens of the Villa Borghese, and they are being cared for and restored. But this is um, this is an exciting. This is the first time that these have been revealed in their current state. Now, these inscriptions are written by the humanist and prefect of the Vatican Library, Bartolomeo Platina. Platina also wrote uh, a humanistic Lives of the Popes, um, and which he began with Christ. Uh, whom he referred to as both emperor and pontifex. So in that context, uh, Sixtus, who appears in that work, as he appears as Pontifex Maximus in these inscriptions, is presented as Christ's successor, em as emperor and pontifex. Another important antiquarian uh, manuscript from the period, that of Bartholomeo Fonzio, um, I, uh, even goes that next step of identifying the Sublician Bridge, uh, over which, which, over which the ancient pontifices maximi seem to have some kind of role of oversight and maintenance with the, the rebuilt Ponte Sisto. The Ponte Sisto uh, associates this rebuilt bridge, built, bridge built on ancient foundations with this other bridge. It's not, but that also suggests some of this imperial idea matching going on in this period. So basically, it's the succession of developments leading us to this point that finally make that association with imperial titulature easier and, should, and, and suggest to us why it was Pontifex Maximus among all of the imperial titles that exist in ancient usage and in ancient inscriptions that became the Pope's own imperial title. But it's also a matter of location. So where we are standing here uh, we're standing on the Ponte Garibaldi, which is a modern uh, bridge for traffic uh, over the Tiber in Rome. We're looking downstream at the Ponte Cestio and upstream towards the Ponte Sisto. So this, these bridges were then immediate neighbors. And in fact, they would have been even more visible to each other and even more striking in their landscape um, before the embankment of the Tiber. Um, towards the end of the 19th century, when the bridges were longer and the area around them was lower. So they would have, they would have been even more imposing, more noticeable to the viewer. And, um, and if you were on one of them, you would be looking in one way to see Gratian as Pontifex Maximus, and the other way to Sixtus as Pontifex Maximus. 
From this moment and through this securitous route, the Pontifex Maximus was back as the imperial bridge builder of antiquity. Romanness thus construed had a major effect on the development of the imperial papacy. To borrow the words from Pope Sixtus's medal that we saw two slides ago, the Pontifex Maximus was a sacri cultor with cura rerum publicarum. That is, the care, the responsibility for public affairs, that may be rerum publicarum, but really in the plural life, it's also alluding to his responsibility for two republics, the Roman Republic and the Christian Republic, both in peace and in war. Especially in that latter respect, it reaches its zenith under Sixtus's nephew, Julius II, at the beginning of the 16th century. Erasmus, when in Rome, was once shocked to hear Pope Julius addressed in an oration as Jupiter Optimus Maximus. Uh, and described as thundering, like the chief god of the Roman pantheon. But the success of this ideology is why we take the papal adoption of this one imperial title for granted. Yet arguments about history and precedent began here. What the historical precedent for papal power is, that is, would be central to the confessional histories of the subsequent century. And that really goes beyond our story. But historicizing the papacy, that is, putting Roman history at the foundations of papal power, had some unforeseen consequences as well. And that's where King James I comes in. Comes in in the form of his letter uh, to Pope Paul V, written in response to Pope Paul in Cardinal Bellarmine's letters to the English Catholics. Uh, calling for them to give their allegiance to the Pope and not to their king, James. So these are some of the unforeseen consequences that James picks up on. Because the Pope was an heir, via Augustus, to an institution created by Numa Pompilius, James is saying, then he was not really the successor to St. Peter under the institution of Christ. But more to the point, he was heir to an office created by a king, and thus he was subject to a king's laws. And the laws of Numa, for that matter, only extend as far as the temporal power of Rome, meaning that while the Pope's law was fine to stand within the papal states, James had no problems with that, James and his kingdom were free. And in the process, the Pontifex Maximus that title, now a papal title, but created by the second king of Rome, could be understood, in fact, as a, as a concession that it was the king who was in charge of the church and of religious law. So, historicizing papal power as a means for its promotion in the hands of the papacy, therefore also pointed the way towards its diminution undermining the, universi uh, the universality of the Catholic Church and leaving the door open to Caesar Papism. Thank you.